No, you're good. Churches should function, and they talk about, you know, you hear manipulation, you hear business plan, you hear, you know, CEO pastors, and do you want? I want you to understand something. What we're going to talk about today started with Jesus and his disciples. That what I'm sharing was how the very first church ran itself. But this is this this model is over two it's like two thousand years old. <coughs> that we're going back to the roots of the roots of the roots to understand how God, God's heart was communicated through people. So when when you think about these verses that we're sharing and the points that I'm making, think about the fact that this was Peter, Paul, Timothy, John, the boys, the Mary Marthas of the world sitting around breaking bread. Look at this. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as the one who speaks the oracles of God Whoever serves as the one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Live with the end in mind. Uh, there's a book that I love that is pretty deep by Chuck Colson, Blake Chuck Colson. And uh, was talk he, he talks about how, based upon all this, how should we live? Mm -hmm. You know? <coughs> There's something to be said for us knowing why we do what we do. I'll say that again. There's something about knowing why we do what we do. From time to time, the church must have a conversation with itself. Hard questions need to be asked. And if those answers are wanting, do whatever is necessary to bring ourselves to a place of a balanced accountability. We gotta talk about these things because in this crazy world that we live in, it's so easy to get out of balance. It's so easy to sit back and say, well, we're gonna pay so-and-so to be a youth pastor, and he'll take care of all that. It's so easy to say, hey, the church will teach my kids about the Bible. I'm sorry. It ain't in Scripture. Not my job to teach your kids. It's your job to teach your kids. Go back to Deuteronomy 6. It says, at the table, have spiritual conversations. That's where it starts. We're a support mechanism. My job is to help shape mature disciples. That's what a pastor's job is. You see, we get so far out of balance in America because we're wealthy. Because we can pay for things. So here are the questions, are the questions I want you to wrestle with. One, what's my place within the body? Why am I here? What has God called me to do? Not us. We'll get to that one. What has God called you individually to do? 
Here's a hard one. Because it's tough to measure sometimes. Am I contributing to the good of the whole? Is what I'm doing making a difference? You see, each of us needs to determine for ourselves an answer to my vocation and my invocation. The identity which God has purposed for all of us. You see, I have a vocation. I am an emergency services dispatcher. That's my job. I have an invocation, a calling without repentance. I'm a pastor, I'm a missionary. I'm a little A apostle because I'm a church planner, because I'm a strategist, I can look and see. Then, here's the other part. We as a church need to wrestle with this question. What is our collective impact on our community and each other? What's our halo effect? You see, there's the, there's the standard, there's the measuring stick. What impact are we having? Are we doing good? Or are we being destructive? If we, if the foundry disappeared from the face of the earth tomorrow, for whatever apparent reason, would our community be weak or would they celebrate? You see, when or we start, would they notice? Would they even notice? Yeah. Here's a quote for you from Dr. Love. It's not enough to have lived. We should be determined to live for something. May I suggest that it be created, be, that it be creating joy for others, sharing what we have for the betterment of person kind, bringing hope to the lost and love to the lonely. Leo Grishev, late Leo, Dr. Love from PBS from the 1980s. He's a professor who talked about his whole big spiel was, how do we love each other? How do we love our community? You see, there's a mindset that each of us needs to possess. An understanding, not just of our purpose, but how we can contribute to God's plans on earth. <clears throat> there's fulfillment, satisfaction, great contentment to be discovered. Many of us struggle with self-esteem issues. We feel unworthy. We feel as though we aren't making a bit of difference. But you see, here's the thing. The Bible tells us exactly how we should go about life. The book is our, gosh, you guys, you guys don't even remember the repair manuals. Chilton, anybody remember the Chilton repair manuals? Sure. Yeah. You know, I bought my Volkswagen, my 1974 Volkswagen, and I bought with it a Chilton's repair book. It was the Bible. It told me everything I ever needed to about that car. <laughs> Well, your Bible is your Chilton book. It is your mechanic special. And you get into the Word of God. Why? Because it has the answers to the hard questions for your own life. And if you're not in it, you're in trouble. Because you're going to be tempted to self-fix yourself. Or listen to some guru about something that is talking a bunch of twaddle. Who has no clue. You see, this passage in chapter, verse 1, that we didn't actually read, speaks about how we should not live like godless Gentiles. That's where Paul was starting out with this thing. He's saying, or excuse me, Peter was starting out with this thing. He's saying, listen, don't live like the Gentiles live. That past lifestyle is destructive, and within, within it is death. People who have been given over to that life will never understand why you don't join them. Only the Holy Spirit can make anyone aware of their sin and destructive nature. Listen, when you come to Christ, there's lifestyle issues that you leave behind. Why? Because they're destructive. They're harmful. They're, they're you know, um, I gave up, I really liked beer. I saw my Uncle Wilbur being abusive. When you drank. I saw my brother face down in his own vomit a few times. You know? I saw a couple other family members who were not pretty drunks. Let's go share more about this next week with talking about how do we have Jesus in our everyday conversation. But when I moved into my frat house as a junior in college at Westchester, we were voted the best bar on campus. My apartment. Because we had over 400 liquor bottles. Well, my roommate and I came to Christ. And God convicted us that this was no longer who we were. 
And we had a pouring party. I had so many frat brothers, like little, 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 uh, little, you know, the little cats with the rubber, rubber uh, suction cups on the windows that the cars used to have. I had all these guys up against the windows of our kitchen. We were having a pouring party. We pulled it all into the, in the, the kitchen, and one bottle, thank God nobody lit a match, one bottle at a time we were pouring it down the sink. Because we wanted to send a testimony that this was no longer our identity. But you see, your identity is who God says you are. Through God's grace, you have found liberty and freedom. There is an indulgence that we are called to make, a giving away of ourselves, living for Him. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about ministry. We're living not for ourselves any longer, but for others. Why? Because it makes Him smile. And two, because it honors and glorifies Him. That's why we do what we do. In, verse, in Matthew 16, Jesus told his disciples, If anyone wants to come to me, come after me. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Charles Wesley had a great quote. It says this. Excuse me, John Wesley. One of the principal rules of religion is to lose no occasion of serving God. And since he was, and since God is invisible to our eyes, we are to serve him in our neighbor, which he receives as if done to himself in person, standing visibly before us. You and I are, to call, are called because of who God is, because of what he has done in our life, to serve others. As if God is standing there before us. Romans 12, 1 and 2, turn there if you would. I'm not going to keep you long today, because we're going to talk about some of this over lunch. Romans 12. I love this passage. I appeal to you, therefore, my brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you discern what the will of God is, that, excuse me, the, what the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When I give a food box, I am worshiping God. When someone helps a disabled child or a disabled adult, you are worshiping God. When I sit there and I'm, when I'm sitting there and someone is pouring out their heart to me and I'm listening and I'm unpacking and praying for them as I'm listening, I'm worshiping God. Everything we do is worship. May 15th, if you want to put this down in your calendar, it's a $30 retreat. We are partnering with John Maxwell and Right Now Media, and we are hosting an all-day retreat on workship. How do we worship in our daily lives? And there's going to be a lot of really cool people on video, live on video that we're going to be listening to. But the simple matter of fact is that, yes, every single thing I do is worship. It all is. It all is. It's to his glory. Why do we do what we do to his glory? When the Bible talks about that we're going to lay our crowns at his feet, we were, you know, for doing good, you're going to get a crown. The Bible says so. But, but the Bible also says that the moment that we get it, we're going to chuck it in a big pile and say, unto you, God. Why? Because it's unto him. Because we can't do anything without him. I have no strength. Boy, have I found that out. My strength's in him. I'm able to do what I do because of his grace. Henry Ward Beecher, who was a quite colorful evangelist in the old two centuries ago, says, greatness lies not in being strong, but being the right use of strength. And strength is not used rightly when it serves only to carry a man above his fellows for his own solitary glory. 
he is the greatest who whose strength carries up the most hearts by attraction of his own. Listen, I don't do what I do on my strength. I have found out that I can do more on his strength. And it's lasting. If I try to do it on my own, it's going to get messed up. But if I'm following his hand, if I'm using his gifts, I'm speaking his truth, I'm serving people the way he wants to be served, he will bless. In Galatians 5, 15, 13 through 15, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Not only use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, do not use your freedom for an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, <coughs> watch out that you are not consumed by one another. We are called to exercise the freedom God gives us to do good. See, each of us has been given gifts that are both spiritual and physical. I'm going to give you some concepts here that I'm not expecting you to totally grasp today. But we're going to talk about it over lunch. We're going to talk about it in her small group. We're going to unpack this because it's important for you to understand. Each of us are called to use our gifts both inside and outside of the church. As a pastor, I'm called to do certain things within the church. My main function is to develop leaders, to develop mature disciples. Do you hear that? That is what my function is. All the other minutia <laughs> that seems like comes at me as a tsunami, I'm managing the interruptions. Because those are the two things I'm supposed to be focused on whole part of them. But see, I'm called to equip the church to serve within and without. As I see needs in our community, I look to see is our church equipped to meet those needs. When we started, we did a spiritual gifts test of everybody that was here 12 years ago. At the same time, we were out in the neighborhood talking to people, praying with people, looking to see what God was doing. And then we tried to mesh the two up. Where did our giftedness match the needs that we received? And we said, we're not going to try to do them all. Let's pick one. Let's pick two. Maybe three. No more. Because if we do more than three, we're going to flat out and be mediocre at everything. What are the best opportunities for us as church members to thrive and have the greatest impact? Personally, I am consistently looking for opportunities to lead us to invest in people. Acts 1.8, I take really seriously. It's led me into some interesting things. You see, see, we have an inside game, and we have an outside game. As a body of Christ. But so you, you have gifts and abilities and talents that you are called by God to function within this body. But you also have talents and gifts and responsibilities to function outside this body. It led Joy and I in 1979 because we were youth, basically youth pastors. We had, a, we had a group of 12 kids, and we asked them, what would you like to do in order to win your friends to Christ? Categorically, all of them, can we do a magazine? We were dumbfounded. First, we were both working in publishing. Okay, I manage titles for, for Fox Communications. It led us to start a magazine called Jam. And we eventually <coughs> were printing 6,000 a month. These kids had a vision to reach out to kids all over the country. We had kids who were consistently sending in materials to be published. We were in 38 states, all of Canada, Guam, and Japan, where we were just being distributed. what God called us to do. When I was, as a pastor, when I was hearing 
kids coming in the door saying, all I have in my fridge at home is a bag of strawberries and a bag of shrimp. I'm hungry. We started with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and chicken noodle soup at youth group. That led us to partner, me partner with Gary Johnson down at Amazing Grace Ministries, which led me to partner with somebody else, which led me to partner with somebody else. And today, we have been named by Feed America as one of the healthy pantries in Delaware County. God led me. Listen, there are organizations out there that are near and dear to your own heart. Lord, pro-life causes, near and dear to your heart, and you're a leader in that area. He's a model for all of us. Crispy, you're involved in, in filmmaking. And you're a leader. You're speaking. You're trying to figure out how to speak into that without being the crazy Christian. You know? We all have areas that we're passionate about. And I want to encourage you. Use your gifts. Speak into lives. Maybe there's a cause. Maybe there's a board that you can serve on where you can bring the light of Christ. But there's also things in here that you can do. You see, we're an ambassador. I got a little bit ahead of myself. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 says, that If there are any, anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The old, the new has come. And from this, and this is, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us to the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us to bring the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For, for his sake, we were made, he was, excuse me, for our sake, he made him to be sin, for who knew no sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. There are three areas I'm going to introduce. One, <coughs> serving at the church. As Christians, we serve at the church. What's that mean? Physical service, hospitality, within the building. I know Ash has got this long list of possibilities that we're going to talk about in a lunch. But each and every one of us has a place here. Why? Because we're called to edify and build up each other. Which is point two, serving in the church. We serve at the church, but we serve in the church. By serving in the church, we're the body of Christ. And service towards one another in mentorship, which fosters discipleship and creates a healthy spiritual community. You are all called to be encouragers. Why do I hate gossip? Because gossip is tearing down. Why do I hate politics? Because it's tearing down. There's no middle ground. After the services, we should be talking about what our weeks were like, who we blessed, how God used you, listening to each other. If someone's down, lift them up and encourage them. That is what service in the church looks like. And then they're serving as the church, external, physical, and spiritual, defining how we serve the community. We're an arts church. We're created people. We help those who are out of the, so, so to speak, writer's block edge of life. And they're on the, they're, they're, they climb beyond the window still, and they're on the ledge on the third story, and they're not quite sure where to go in their life. You minister to artsy people. If you hear on open mic night, you will meet artsy people. I started asking people this week, where are you from? You people come as far as downtown to do, do stuff with us? And most, believe it or not, live in Edie Wallingford. They're not here, some in Ridley. That's our footprint. It's pretty big. We serve food. This past two semesters, we fed 520 college students. Do you hear that? Do you know how many college students there are at Widener? 3,000. We fit, what's that? My math people. About a sixth. About a sixth. Twenty percent ish. Six to a fifth, somewhere like that. Yeah. It's a lot of kids. 
But you know, we also fed, well, we actually did backpacks for 120 kids, 130 kids. We feed about 100 of them a week on a good week. Those families are now starting to come. We started over at Kinder Park. We gave some food baskets to a, uh, a women's outing. And a family showed up two weeks ago and been coming regularly now. We're meeting needs in the area of food. AA meetings. You know, they're not our AA meetings. We host them. We partner with them. And we had one group that got so big, the leaders came and said, hey, could we do a Saturday meeting? It's a little smaller, a little more personal. Sure. Both of those meetings are impacting 40 to 60 people a week. When you look at the impact that those folks are doing. Mm -hmm. Scouts. We are not only hosting our own troop, all of our own neighborhood kids and kids from Chester, but we are now hosting regional groups that meet here, say, once a month, once a quarter. We're having influence. We're doing good. And the question is, where do you fit in? What's God called you to do? Maybe there's something we're not doing that you think we should be doing. Well, let's talk about it. Maybe the things that you want to do but don't have the courage to do, we just need a little support from us to take a step of faith. One of my favorite people who's a believer in Christ is Scott Hamilton. Do you know who Scott Hamilton is? Mm -hmm. Ice skater? Yeah. Oh, okay. Olympic skater? Mm -hmm. He has gone through three battles with cancer. Brain tumors. Brain tumors. Yeah. Well, he, he said this quote, and this quote really astonished me. It said, focus on building up others, and your own sense of self-worth will improve. Some call this random act is of acts of human kindness, but the truth is, acting unselfishly is not a random act at all. Instead, it is a conscious, consorted effort to make the world better by making someone else's life better. Mm -hmm. Bonus, you'll be happier by doing it. Paul said, I have great contentment in whatever state I'm in. My desire this year is you find that state. State of contentment. State, state of purpose. You're on a mission for <laughs> Blues Brothers. Greatest line ever. <laughs> We're on a mission from God. Amen. <laughs> you know? We are. We are. So let's find the journey together. Father, have a way. I just have your way with us this morning. Over lunch, can we unpack some things in a small group where we just unite and fellowship and, and talk and encourage one another on this journey? Uh, again, Father, just have your way. Lead, God. May we make you smile at the decisions that we make. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.